morning. I want to welcome I want to welcome you all on behalf of Lois's family and on behalf of uh, the family here at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Bloomington. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. I want to uh, let you know that it, should you need a restroom, they are around out these doors around to the right. Um, and also I want to extend a welcome to you on behalf of the family to join us um, after the service for a, a light lunch and an opportunity to connect and to share uh, in memories and in our grief. Welcome. In the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world, we are gathered here together today to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our sister Lois, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. And the people say, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life. We praise you. And the people say, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. And the people say, we worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to open your hymnals, the red hymnal in the, in the pew front in front of you, and open to page 629, hymn number 629, Abide With Me. 629.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Lois. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until, by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I want to invite Lois's son, John, up to share some words about his mom. Good morning. Well, my mother was a copy editor, so she uh, would be horrified if uh, she saw how much I wrote. So apologies in advance for uh, how long this is going to be. But you got to understand, my brother died uh, in 1995, so I figured I had to say a few words for him, too. So consider this two eulogies from two sons. And then I have uh, a piece that I'm going to read uh, from her uh, friend Joyce that she uh, gave us to read. Lois Torvik was my mom. She was a wonderful mom. She was born in Hibbing, Minnesota in 1939. So she was part of what is known as the silent generation, the people born roughly between 1928 and 1945. The preceding American generation was known as the greatest generation, and with good reason. They fought in World War II, defeating the oppression of Nazi Germany and the Japanese Empire. The silent generation was born a bit too late to fight at Normandy in World War II, and a bit too early to fight at, uh, in the Korean conflict. They were certainly told that children were to be seen and not heard, and they were not to complain because their parents and aunts and uncles were busy saving the world. And oh, by the way, the greatest generation also survived the Great Depression. So please, keep silent, you silent generation. And for the most part, keep silent, they did, including my mom. Well, sort of, for the most part. When mom was born, her dad, my grandpa Armin Eirich, <clears throat> had them write WPA as his employer on her birth certificate. WPA stood for the Works Progress Administration, a federal program designed to create work projects all over the country, like the Hoover Dam, to employ the millions of Americans who were unemployed during the Great Depression from 1929 to 39. The fact that Grandpa Armin worked for the WPA when Mom was born pretty much guaranteed that they were not wealthy. And possibly at times, Grandpa Armin and Grandma Ruby ate a little bit less so their kids could be well fed. For sure, there was no extra money when Mom was born. Later, Grandpa Armin, though, got a good job as a tool and die maker at Honeywell, and he had good paying benefits thanks in part to the labor union of which he was a proud member. Speaking of labor unions, my dad used to tell me, John, I vote for the man. I don't belong to any political party. But with your mom, it's DFL or die. Because she grew up the daughter of a union man. So I always knew my mom would vote Democrat. Once I started to vote, I mostly voted Republican. So I remember giving mom a hard time when she and Minnesota were the only state of the union to vote for Mondale in the 1984 presidential election, plus the District of Columbia. Um, and she would just smile and love me like only a mom can. When I was recorded by a reporter and shown on the TV news uh, for decrying the way the Democrats turned the late Senator Wellstone's memorial service into a political rally in 2002, I talked to her that evening and said, Mom, did you see me on TV? And she said, yes, I did. You looked good. <laughs> With a smile, but no comment on the position I took. That was Mom. No judgment, just love. When mom came of age and it was time to graduate from North High School in Minneapolis in 1957, her traditional father told her he would pay for her to go to vocational school, but not for college. However, mom wanted to go to college, so she stayed home and worked for a year and then went to Waldorf College in Iowa for two years, got her associate's degree, and then in 1960 she transferred to Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, where she met my dad, Roger Torvik, from Sisseton, in South Dakota. Again, all of these college expenses were on her nickel because her dad wouldn't help her pay for college. 
but she earned enough money and went to and graduated from college. So we'll call that Exhibit A for how she wasn't always silent. It's important to note that after Grandpa Armin passed away in 1979, Grandma Ruby gave us several thousand dollars to help pay for an addition to our house in Bloomington and a 1967 Chevy Impala that would become the first car I drove with any regularity when I got my driver's license. When I'm sh while I'm sure my Aunt Ardell and Uncle Don received equal shares of Grandma's wealth when Grandpa passed, I think giving my, mo my mom the money and the car was Grandma Ruby's way of making things right financially with my mom to make up for the lack of help she received from her parents when she went to college. Because of the gap year, as they call it now, uh, mom took to make money so she could go to college, she graduated uh, from Concordia a year after my dad in 1962. She got a job with Augsburg Publishing House, eventually holding the title of copy editor. Again, she would have shortened my eulogy. Um, meanwhile, dad worked five years for the state of Minnesota as an internal auditor and then he got a job with, in accounting with Minneapolis Public Schools where he worked until he died in 1993. So kind of a side note, I explained how mom had to pay for almost all of her college expenses. Well, dad's dad died when he was 12 and was the oldest of three kids and his parents had bought a gas station in rural South Dakota and uh, dad was left as the, the man of the house in 1950 with two, two younger siblings and his 38 year old mother but somehow they made it work and they made that gas station go and Grandma definitely you know, paid for a lot of my dad's costs to go into Concordia College. His sister also went there and his brother went to vocational school, so they all got an education. And then I'm sure dad uh, you know, pumped gas or worked at the gas station uh, in the summer uh, during college. But mom and dad, as a result of, of these challenges that they both faced, were very committed to making sure their kids could go to college because they had to work really hard to make that happen for themselves. So mom started working from home part-time in about 1978, uh, doing her copy editing work again for Augsburg until 1988. And they saved enough so I could go to Concordia and Paul could go to St. Olaf College debt-free. We had to work during the summers during college to help pay for some of our living expenses during the college years, but we graduated with no student loans. Sorry, kids. Um, <laughs> my mom and dad only had two kids. Your mom and dad had four. Um, and the cost of college went up way more than the average rate of inflation from the late 1980s to when you went to college in the late 2000s. The good news for my mom's grandchildren <clears throat> is that her grandma gave me instructions when she drew up her last will and testament in 2018 to help them pay for part of their college expenses with part of my inheritance. So they each, <laughs> so they each have received a significant check for the last five years at Christmas time and we'll receive one last significant check in about a month when I settle the affairs of her estate. Exhibit B for how mom was not always silent. Even after she is gone to heaven, she's still telling me what, telling me what to do. <clears throat> Mom's generosity has not been limited to cash contributions. After dad died, she asked if I could take her car shopping because, of course, dad had always bought the cars in the family. She bought a new 1993 Honda Accord and drove it for five years. When it was time to buy a new car, I told her she could trade it in for the 1998 Honda that she planned to buy. She said, no, I'll just give you the 1993 Honda. I think you could use a newer and safer car. She was right. But I protested and said I would pay her for it. She said, no, I'll just give it to you. That gift happened a total of five times over the next 21 years. Almost every five years, Mom would buy a new car and give me the old one. With the 93 Honda Accord we received in 98, I pretty much drove that until it died because none of the kids were old enough yet to drive. But starting with the 1998 Honda Accord that we received in 2004, I would drive the next few cars she gave us and then they become kid cars. After the 1993 and 98 Accord, she gave us a 2005 Acura TL, a 2011 Toyota RAV4, and finally a 2016 Subaru Forester. Amazing generosity in Exhibit C on how she was not always silent. Back to mom's story. On May 16th of 1964, mom and dad got married. In 1965, they bought their first house at 9312 Fifth Avenue South. I'm pointing roughly to over there, where, where it is, five minutes from here. Bloomington was then a fast-growing suburb that was building new skill, school buildings as fast as they could in the 1960s and early 70s. She would live in that house for 54 years, so it was the only house I ever knew growing up. I was born in 66, same year as this building, 
Bo Paul was born in 1970, and mom left Augsburg and became a stay-at-home mom after I was born. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, uh, mom experienced loss at a young age when her dad died in 1979 at the relatively young age of 67. Mom was only 39 or 40 at the time. <clears throat> Grandpa Armin had been a lifelong smoker during adulthood, favoring cigarillos, as evidenced by all the empty cigarillo boxes he used for nuts and bolts in his workshop in the basement of their house and in the garage in North Minneapolis on 28th and Newton Avenue North. Remember that, Newton. I remember coming home from school that day and mom was crying as she worked to prepare supper in the kitchen. I asked her what was wrong and she said, your grandpa died. I said I was sorry and biked the one block to the Wolf's house. Uh, Jim Wolf and his wife Joanne are here and um, the Wolf's family garage served as the paper depot for us paper boys. Can you kids bring me my water, please? Who delivered in the afternoon Minneapolis Star paper on weekdays and the morning Minneapolis Tribune paper on weekends in the late 1970s. I cried as I, thank you, I cried as I biked that one block as this was the first time I had lost a close relative to death. Meanwhile, our family had other health challenges. My younger brother Paul, born in 1970, was diagnosed with Becker's muscular dystrophy around 1975 and had to have a pacemaker implanted because of heart trouble around 1978. Becker's MD was a milder form of the dreaded Duchenne's muscular dystrophy with Duchenne's MD uh, in the 1970s, only boys got it and their body withered away to the point they would be in a wheelchair by about age 10 and die by about age 20. Paul thankfully was diagnosed with only Becker's MD, so my parents were told that they could expect him to need a, a wheelchair, wouldn't need that until he was in his 40s or 50s, and that he should live into at least his 60s. Mom had a very dear friend in a woman named Pat Adams. Mom and Pat worked to make Bloomington schools more accessible for kids with special physical needs. If you can believe it, they didn't have elevators uh, in, in schools back then. So that was exhibit D for how she was not always silent. Pat, this good friend of mom's, she's still living out in Georgia. She lost her oldest son, Patrick, to heart trouble in Duchenne's MD in 1981. Her youngest son, Phil, also had Duchenne's MD. He and my brother, Paul, were very close friends. They won two state championships together for adaptive floor hockey and soccer in 1987 and 1988, uh, a fact of which I am so proud. Phil died in 1991 when Paul was still in college. Unbelievably, Pat also lost her son, Paul. She had a son named Paul Adams. He was my high school classmate and track and cross country teammate. He was the one guy in their family who was healthy, one son that was healthy, and he died of cancer in 2019. Uh, some people like Pat and my mom, it seems like they go through a lot, but we all go through things, right? We all suffer loss. But for, for my mom, it, it kind of came boom, boom with, with dad and Paul in a short period of time, and then her mother died shortly after that. So back to dad. He had ulcerative colitis when he was 18. That's when he found out he had that, so he, he went to the draft signed up, you know, like you had to do back then, uh, and um, they said, sorry, we can't take you, you have, cold, you, have um, you know, you have ulcerative colitis. So that's how he found out he had ulcerative colitis. Well, at some point in the mid-1970s, his, his doctor said, you should have your colon taken out. And the surgery was explained to me in the terms an eight or nine-year-old, uh, like I was at the time, could understand, which was dad would have this bag thing outside his body and, to go to the bathroom. The next thing I knew, dad didn't have the surgery, and mom and I were told his doctor decided it wasn't necessary. Mom, meanwhile, began to suffer from depression and anxiety in the 1980s, and other chronic illnesses like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome would follow in the 1990s. She, would, she was diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse at least 30 years ago. A recent Google search by me reminded me that mitral valve prolapse is a type of heart valve disease that affects the valve between the left heart chambers Signs and symptoms of mitral valve prolapse are due to the amount of blood leaking backward through the valve. In other words, she had leaky heart valves, but the leakiness wasn't too bad, bad because they were able to control it with medication rather than surgery. Well, fast forward to 1992, dad had exploratory surgery on August 14th, 1992. That was mom's 53rd birthday. Dad, 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 couldn't you have scheduled that for another day? That's probably just what the doctor said. They did, they, that's one thing the silent generation did. They, they did whatever the doctors said. They didn't ask a lot of questions. Anyway, 
they had this uh, surgery to figure out why he was having abdominal problems and found out he had this bad cancer, as his surgeon called it, which had spread to his lymph nodes. He survived that surgery and chemotherapy, and thankfully mom, dad, and Marilyn and I were able to go on a wonderful two-week trip to Norway and Sweden in uh, 1993, where dad got to meet some of his Norwegian relatives for the first time, but dad got sick again shortly after we got back and died on October 23rd, 1993, at age 54. Mom was also 54. Well, after Dad's first cancer surgery in 1992, he confessed to Mom that it was he and not the doctor who had decided not to have the colostomy surgery to remove his colon back in the 1970s. Mom didn't tell me that information until a year or two after Dad died, of course, to spare me uh, the, having that pain along with the pain of losing him. Um, I didn't walk in his shoes, and I have long since forgiven him, but it was a hard truth for Mom and me to know because if he had had his colon taken out, according to my... Uh, uncle who was a doctor, well, he obviously couldn't have gotten colon cancer. That Christmas in 1993, we told mom Marilyn was pregnant with our first child. Mom grinned and just replied with a one-word question, when? On August 26, 1994, our first child, Josiah, was born. Mom was thrilled. Mom was a very safe driver and almost never sped, but I swear she arrived at the hospital about 20 minutes after I called her to tell her uh, that Josiah had been born. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I think it was a little sooner than Marilyn wanted her to get there. <clears throat> Thanks, Marilyn, for putting up with mom and me. Uh, she brought one or, or more new outfits for Josiah every time she came to see him. And she came over a lot because we asked her to babysit quite often. And she lived just 25 minutes away from our house in Savage. We asked her a number of times to please tell us if we were asking her to babysit too much, and she would always say, it could never be too much. Then on February 6, 1995, Marilyn called me at work. My brother Paul's work had called our house because he had listed me as the emergency contact. He had missed a flight that morning. He was an internal auditor for Norwest Bank, now Wells Fargo. I tried to call Paul at the house where he lived, but he didn't answer. <clears throat> this was before cell phones. Um, after trying unsuccessfully to reach his roommate at his work, I drove to his house. The doors were locked, uh, but the front door to the house wasn't closed all the way, so I was able to get in. I found Paul on his bedroom floor. He had died uh, that morning of a heart arrhythmia while packing his suitcase for his work trip. He was 24 years old. I called Marilyn with this awful news, and the police who came when I dialed 911 when I found my brother encouraged me to tell my mom in person. So I went to her house and waited for her to get home from work and then gave her the news that no parent ever wants to hear that their child has died before them. It was the worst day of my life. And I'm pretty sure it was the worst day of mom's life. Thankfully, Josiah had been born, as I mentioned, back on August 26th of 94. This was February 6th, uh, 1995. And we, as we sat at mom's house with family and friends surrounding us, Josiah did what any five-month-old would do. He smiled and talked and crawled around and made us laugh and smile through the tears. To make matters worse, Grandma Eirich, mom's mom, died on August 23, 1997 with Alzheimer's. So in a span of four years, mom lost her husband to cancer at age 54, her youngest son to heart failure at age 24, and her mom to Alzheimer's at age 84 after she had struggled with Alzheimer's the last 10 years of her life. Well, after so much loss, it would have been understandable for mom to withdraw and feel sorry for herself. Instead, she poured herself into her grandchildren, Josiah, Caleb, Noah, and Siri, babysitting them dozens and dozens of times attending nearly all of their K through 12 scouting, sports, and musical events, teaching arts in the classroom in their elementary school classes, taking them to Minneapolis Institute of Arts exhibits, taking them to Perkins about a thousand times. Um, they love Perkins. The Perkins and Savage was really sorry to see them go when uh, they got too old and you know, didn't need a babysitter anymore. I think that was a good ticket for the, the Perkins uh, when, when mom would bring them there. Anyway, she volunteered regularly at the Russian Arts Museum in Minneapolis. Finally, she got involved with a movement called Reimagining that looked at the Bible through the eyes and perspective of a woman. Here was exhibit E for how she wasn't always silent. In 2018, mom fell at home and decided it was time to move into assisted living. So after a brief stint at Presbyterian Homes in Prior Lake, until a spot opened up in Bloomington, she moved to apartment 147 of the Commons, the assisted living part of Bloomington Presbyterian Homes, for which the street address is 10030 Newton Avenue South. Newton Avenue South. 
So she had grown up for the most part on 28th and Newton Avenue North, and she was going to spend her final years on 100th and Newton Avenue South. She sold the 1993 12 Fifth Avenue house in the summer of 2018 for $275,000. 54 years after she and dad bought it for $18,000. Pretty good return on investment financially in over a half century of priceless memories. Mom's heart issues were pretty stable for about 20 years after this mitral valve prolapse diagnosis. And then about 10 years ago, she got AFib. Her heart, heart doctor tried a couple unsuccessful ablations, heart medicine with unpleasant side effects. So she got a pacemaker in 2007, 2017. Excuse me. That kept the AFib at bay until about a year and a half ago when her heart began to beat with a persistent AFib. However, her heart doctor said, lots of people live a long time with AFib. Then this past January, she started to knock it out of her bedclothes and get dressed. And I knew something was up because mom always got dressed. I asked the nurse coordinator to set up a care conference for mom, but then she got dehydrated and had to go to the hospital for IV fluids at the end of January. Two days later, when she came back from the hospital, she was too weak to go back to her assisted living apartment. So she went to the, back to room 216 in the transitional care on the other side of the building from her apartment, but thankfully in the same building. A couple weeks later, she woke up Sunday morning, uh, the 18th, and was having trouble breathing. Had to go back to the hospital because her oxygen level that they measured at transitional care was below 50%, which the ER doctor told me is nearly dead. They discovered uh, when they did an echocardiogram at the hospital that her heart pumping function was fine, but her leaky valves had gotten leakier. After starting out <clears throat> the week nearly dying before arriving at the ER on February 18th, she fought her way back to where she was off oxygen, off IV fluids, and eating and drinking by mouth. After earlier in the week, the doctor had, in his first conversation with us, focused a lot on comfort care and or hospice care, because I think that's where he thought things were going. And he was right, just not, not quite yet. So went back to transitional care on Friday, February 23rd, because the hospital doctor said we've done everything we can for her here she'll rest better at transitional care and give her a chance to you know keep keep moving forward in this great progress that she's made over the last five days well on Saturday morning her blood pressure dropped and the nurse called the attending doctor and he said she should go back to the hospital I asked her on multiple occasions with the nurse present on Saturday the 24th and Sunday the 25th if she wanted to leave the transitional care unit and go back to the hospital and she said emphatically no she did not want to go back to the hospital Thus, on Sunday, February 25th, we initiated hospice care. Mom had a do not resuscitate and do not intubate orders in her health care directives, and I had asked Mom if she still wanted those directives to stay the same when she was in the hospital, and she said she did. Also, Mom had expressed to me over the years that she would prefer not to die in a hospital if possible. So on Sunday, February 25th, Mom got to see her precious grandchildren, Josiah, Caleb, Noah, and Siri, and their significant others, and she got to see Marilyn and me, all in the comfort of her nice bed and a large room with enough chairs for all of us, um, me and Marilyn and the kids, to visit with her at uh, Presbyterian Homes and Transitional Care. She and we were so thankful she was there and not at the hospital. Then after we had all go gone home, she passed away at 10, 10 p.m. on Sunday, February 25th. She was always concerned about our safety, so it was just like her to wait until we had all gone home and were pretty much safe in our beds before she passed. So she died on February 25th, 2024, at the age of 84, the same age her mom was when she died. We miss her so much, but we are thankful that she lived a long life, that her struggle has ended, and she is at peace with Jesus in heaven, welcomed by her beloved son Paul her, and husband Roger and many others who have gone before her. She was the last living grandparent to her grandchildren and the last living aunt to the Torvik and Eirik families. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers for mom and us these last weeks and for being here today. God has used your thoughts and prayers and your presence here today to sustain us over this difficult time. We appreciate you very much. Mom loved you, God loves you, and so do we. Thank you. Now I'm going to read this uh, much shorter uh, letter from mom's friend Joyce, and then uh, my daughter-in-law Emily is going to read another uh, uh, piece from some of mom's dear friends um, uh, was given to her, I believe, by Mandy Ilvesacker. Anyway, this is from her friend uh, Joyce. About 20 years ago, I had the good fortune to meet Lois. 
I was in awe of her quiet strength, deep intelligence, and wry sense of humor. She was truly a class act. If you're taking this in, you probably already know that she was kind, caring, smart, funny. I could go on and on. One of the many things I admired about Lois was her sense of adventure when we first met. She was heading off to tour in Europe. I soon learned how important travel and learning were to her. She was so very disappointed when her physical health declined to the point that she could no longer safely manage the rigors of travel. Even as she stuck closer to home, she did not lose her sense of adventure. There were always things to explore around the Twin Cities, and through the years we shared many laughs and good times and fancy desserts. About 10 years ago, we went to check out the Macy's Holiday Display in downtown Minneapolis. As we were shopping for stocking stuffers, Lois mused that she had never sat on Santa's lap. <laughs> we looked at each other and decided it was high time. <laughs> Hilarity ensued. And there's the photo to prove it happened. So I'll set this uh, back where you can see it uh, with the other pictures. But it's a really cute picture of this friend Joyce and mom sitting on Santa's lap. Lois was a sparkling jewel and among the treasures in my life. I miss her terribly. May she rest in peace. Thanks. As John mentioned, I am his daughter-in-law. I married Josiah, uh, Lois's oldest grandson, and I have a letter um, from Lois's college friends to share with everyone today. These memories come from friends that attended Concordia College along with a few others from the Twin City area after college graduation. All had Lutheran backgrounds. Lois came to Concordia in Moorhead for her junior and senior years. She graduated in the spring of 1962. Soon after arriving on campus, Lois joined a social group called Phi Kappa Chi, where three of her friends she met early in, their, in her arrival belonged. After graduation, those of us that lived in the Twin Cities combined our friendships with Lois and two others, one from St. Olaf and one who had been in our high school youth group. Through time, our addresses changed a bit, but we became lifelong friends. This writing includes our memories of Lois. Lois's smile was inviting, and her mannerisms were so gentle. She was a good listener and seemed to always come up with the right response. It was obvious that she did a lot of reading because she had so many good things to share. It was also noted that she did a lot of research when it came time to solve an issue or make an important purchase, not only for herself, but also on behalf of helping others. She was always supportive and helpful. She loved art and music. Lois was an excellent seamstress, home decorator, and gardener. The most obvious thing that always showed was how much she loved her family. Whenever we got together as girlfriends with small children, we had a lot of busy boys. I think John Torvik was the leader and the busiest. <laughs> Finally, as was also stated in the obituary, Lois was a woman of strong faith, resilience, and generosity. She will be greatly missed along with having blessed all who knew her and were inspired by her. We send love to her family that she cherished. Sharon, Dorothy, Pauline, Judy, Annie, Lana, and Mandy.
I am Florence Smallfield, a friend of Lois's. It was an honor to be her friend and to be able to visit her often through the last few years. And a couple of the things that I want to share are things that uh, the family uh, probably didn't even know, maybe. One of the things that I treasure about Lois was that she insisted that our Bartimaeus group read the book Space for God by John Postema. It is a remarkable uh, book, and also it shows the heart of someone like Lois who loves the arts. Another thing that I'd like to share is something that she had me do in calligraphy, calligraphy for her because it gave her strength. She said, the saying was, God provides strength for the day, comfort for the tears, and light for the way. These words helped Lois, and uh, she, her faith was boundless. Good morning, my name is Mona, and I once worked at Presbyterian Homes of Bloomington, and Lois became my friend. She never saw me as a worker, she always saw me as a friend. And every day, when it's kind of like stressful, she and I, she always used to tell me, this is the day the Lord has made, and I respond, will rejoice and be glad in it. I just want to say thank you, um, Lois, for loving me and for her grandkids. Oh, Lois, talk about you. Your mom loves you so much. She talked about you all the time. And she was just there for me when I needed someone to lift me up with. As her son said, she was a silent person, but she was always there for me. I love her and I miss her so much. Thank you. Lois was really important to me because I lost my last grandparent shortly after I started dating her oldest grandson, Josiah. And she stepped in and welcomed me into the family and always treated me like a true granddaughter. As I'm sure the other in-laws feel as well. Jo Lois was, um, she loved everybody so much and she always made you aware that she loved you. And the way that she showed her love was in her generosity. I think the first time that I realized how generous of a woman Lois was, was in college when Josiah was learning how to be an adult for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> he ate a meal of jelly beans and Mountain Dew because, I don't know, that's he has a sweet tooth, and that's what he thought was going to be a good choice to eat for dinner. And when Lois found out, she sent him a $50 check and told him to take care of himself and to buy some real food. <laughs> she was so generous that I think, um, I mean, John talked about all the cars she would buy, and I think, you know, who needs a car every five years? <laughs> Lois because I think she only bought these cars because she knew she would pass them to her kids and grandkids. I think it was her excuse to be more giving. I was always, I don't know, so appreciative of Lois that I am losing a grandparent today too, just through marriage, but really she is just a wonderful woman and we are all going to miss her so much and her generosity.
Um, <clears throat> my name is Herman Call. I don't think anybody here knows me, but that's okay. Uh, I grew up on 26th and, 2630 Bryant Avenue North, North Minneapolis. Irics were down there on 2650 something. I crossed the street and down a few houses. I knew uh, Ardell, Donnie, and Lois. We all went to the same church. So when I got out of the service back in about uh, 56, 57, something like that, I went back to what was called a uh, young adults Christmas party. I don't know if you people had that at your church or not, but they tried to keep the young adults coming to church still. Anyway, there's Ardell and Lois, and there's this other gal over sitting over in the corner. So I asked Lois who she was, and she says, oh, that's Carmen. And then I said, would you introduce her to me? Sure. So she introduced her to me, and it happened that Ardell, that Lois and my wife, Carmen, went to the same junior high together, seventh and eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. But then you have this funny thing back then where you went to junior high and you got a choice of three schools, Minneapolis North, Minneapolis Patrick Henry, and Minneapolis Vocational. So my wife happened to graduate from Patrick Henry. And those days, it, you're supposed to probably stay with the same high school, you like North High. So I went ahead and did the right thing and I started dating her and got married. But you know, after a while, Lois got married. And uh, she and her husband lived in Brooklyn Park, by, I believe. So we got together occasionally. And I lost track after they moved here, out at this end of the world. But uh, I do read the obituaries. And uh, if I knew you from someplace else, yes, I'd come, probably come to your funeral or memorial service or what. I was very surprised that Lois was in the obituaries yesterday or the day before. And I have one other person that I'll have to tell when I see her that Lois had passed away. Thank you for that sharing. We've got one more, and then I invite those of you who have other memories, other things to share, to find the family, find friends, um, and share your words about Lois uh, during lunch after the service. Hi. I'll go really quick. Um, so my name is Sandra Larson. I'm, um, oh, I'm Sandra Larson. I am um, Marilyn and John's niece, um, and. Uh, I guess I just wanted to talk really quick about how um, kind of the special relationship that we, my sister and I, Anna, had, and our family had with Lois. She was um, kind of like a bonus grandma. She was, uh, I, we definitely considered her like a, a third grandma. and. Um, just because we spent so much time together at family functions and um, just w w we were able to share a lot of really happy like family just good times together um, and my favorite memory um, 
I think that I have with Lois is when she took my mom and me to the Russian Art Museum um, and she showed us around and we looked at the art and then we had um, a little fancy lady lunch at Patrick's. Um, we had quiche and you know, that kind of thing. So it's just really special and I will just really, really miss her. Any things that Lois loved in this space, in this congregation, was worship, art and worship, language and worship, and music in worship. So let us now sing together Amazing Grace. You can find that in your hymnal at hymn number 779. 779, Amazing Grace. invite Lois's grandson Josiah, granddaughter Siri, and her friend Florence up to share some words of scripture with, with us all. Josiah, Lois's oldest grandson. This is from Isaiah chapter 40. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? 
the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. My name is Siri. I'm Lois's granddaughter. I'll be reading from Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ and love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 46, please read the responsive lines. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. Utter his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our own. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I invite you to please rise for the reading of the Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter, and God's people say, Glory to you, O Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of the Lord, and we say praise to you, O Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from the one true God who creates, redeems, and sustains us today and always. Amen. All of our scripture readings today offer a description of the character of our God. They each have something to say about who our God is. 
The prophet Isaiah describes the mysterious and incredible creative power of our God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not faint or grow weary, whose understanding is unsearchable. The psalmist describes the peacemaking power of our God, who makes wars cease to the end of the earth, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear, who speaks into times of great conflict and melts the earth. In his letter to the early church in Rome, the Apostle Paul describes the loving power of our God who is for us, who justifies, whose love in Christ Jesus is more powerful than anything we can imagine. And finally, in John's Gospel, Jesus describes the life-giving grace of our God who so loved the world that he gave his only Son. These are all incredible descriptions of the nature of God. God indeed is powerful. God indeed creates a world whose beauty overwhelms. God indeed has strength and knowledge that stretches far beyond our wildest imagination. God indeed brings hope and peace into places devastated by war and despair. God indeed loves with a love that breaks all the boundaries we can conjure. And God indeed comes into this world, breaks into our hearts with grace and with mercy to bring life where there is death. These are powerful words. Words that span centuries. Words that paint a picture of the nature of our God. But that's not the only thing they describe. You see, these words we read today, whether they come from Isaiah, the book of Psalms, Paul's letter to the Romans, or the Holy Gospel of John, aren't just about who God is. They are about what God does for God's people. These are words about God's relationship with us. Our God is not only the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Our God is the God who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Our God is not only the God who breaks the bow and shatters the spear. Our God is also a very present help in our times of trouble. Our God is not only the God who justifies, our God is the God come to us, yes, us, you and me, in love. A love that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from. Our God is not only the God who lovingly gave his only son. Our God is the God who did this so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Our God is a powerful God, yes. But our God is not a distant God, no. Our God is a God of relationship. A God who, in the words of my sainted Grandpa Rusty, his favorite hymn, My God, How Wonderful Thou Art, our God is a God who stoops to ask of us the love of our poor heart. Lois knew a little something about this God of relationship, this God who comes to walk alongside us, this God who seeks to share love and peace and beauty and life with all this world. This God whose knowledge and strength knows no end and yet cares about little old us. Whether it was in her devotion to her children and grandchildren and bonus grandchildren, whether it was in her dedication to the promotion of an education about art, 
whether it was in her consistent drive to deepen the spirituality of the work of Bartimaeus, our worship group here at Christ the King. Lois, in her own quiet but, not, but straightforward way, knew that wonderful things were meant to be shared. Lois, named and claimed as a beloved child of God at her baptism, knew the restorative, salvific, liberating, life-giving power of God's abundant and grace-filled love. And she knew just what to do with all of that love that God first gave her. Share it with all. Today is a hard day. Today we bid farewell to the Lois whose presence in our life we cherished deeply. Today we begin to reckon with her absence with the lowest-sized hole in the universe. And there's no way around it. The work of grief, the work of mourning, the work of experiencing and understanding this new world without Lois is hard work. But the thing about hard work is that it is only made easier with help. The help we find in the arms of the people we love. The help we find in the ears willing to listen. The shoulders ready to cry on. The sharing of memories between those who loved Lois. That is, after all, one of the main reasons why we are here. This is why we do this gathering together in a room, joining together in prayer, sitting down to eat and share with one another. This grief is not a journey we embark upon alone. We do this together. But we don't only have one another to rely upon in these hard times. We don't only have our family, friends, loved ones to carry us when we need help facing this new reality. Our help also comes from the Lord, our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble, who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. The Lord, our God, who comes to us in love, our God who brings a love even stronger than the love we share with one another, a love even surer than the love Lois had for us and we had for Lois, a love which is complete and knows no bounds, no end. This is the love that Paul is talking about in Romans when he writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the love that which God extends freely through Christ, surrounds us, fills us, and equips us to face these difficult times. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. This love is the love in which we are created, the love which keeps us as we live, and the love which one day calls us all home. These words we hear today are powerful words, ancient words, but these are not merely words of the past. These are words of love written in our hearts by our God. These are words of love echoed in the relationships we share with one another the relationship we shared with Lois. So today, as we gather together to celebrate a life lived in love, with love, for love, let us also give that love to one another. Let us remember, let us laugh, let us cry, let us sing our songs of praise and thanksgiving And let us love on one another.
Let us share that love with the world, just like Lois did, just as God has done, is doing, and will do until the end of time and beyond. Amen. I invite you now to sing our hymn of the day, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, number 502. And now, with the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn, and a sure and certain hope 
in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days of head. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives we shall live also. And that, again, those words, neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us now commend our beautiful sister Lois to the mercy of God, our Maker and our Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Lois. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us now sing together, Beautiful Savior, hymn number 838.
invite you to rise as you are able to receive this benediction. God bless you and keep you. God's face shine on you with mercy and with grace. God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us go forth in peace in the name of Christ. And the people say thanks be to God.